At the start of the year, it is obviously one where we start to think about where our life's going. And often we want to make changes. And I think many of us think perhaps in our relationship with God and our walk with God, we want to we want to see growth. We want to see progress. We want to see changes. We want to see freedom from things that used to hold us. We, we want things to be different that we, that we realize are not in line with God's will. And we, we have this desire to change things. And it makes me think of the people of Israel when they were in slavery. I mean, they had this desire that things would change. They had this longing for years that God would take them out of slavery, that they'd have a new life, that they'd, they'd be able to live differently. And so at the start of their new year, which happened to be the Passover, Jesus, uh, the, the, God said to them at the Passover, this is a new year. He led them out of slavery into Egypt. And yet what we sadly know from history is that he got them out. He gave them a new year, a new start, and they, they were all setting out to be God's free people. And what happened is sadly, they soon shifted back to old settings. They soon shifted back to the slave mindsets of Egypt. And in the end, God could not take them out of the wilderness into the promises that he had for them. The things that, that he'd said were theirs, they couldn't enter because they wandered from his ways. And I think for many of us, we might look with judgment on Israel's history, but the scriptures in the New Testament tell us we must take warning from them. We must take heed from them that in our own hearts also, we can have all kinds of resolutions at the start of the year to have our lives different, to, to grow closer with God. But we also realize that maybe we've tried it many times before. And weeks, months later, we slip back to our old defaults. And so today I want to launch a very short series that we've called First Things First. And it's got to do with the fact that when we want to see real change in our lives, there's certain things that have to be changed first. We can't start changing other things with resolutions and those things. We've got to start somewhere else. And so I'm going to be focusing on Israel's journey and uh, the lessons that we can learn. And the first thing that I want to start out with this morning is that we see that God, at the outset of their new year, He gave them a command, and it was a command to change the heart. And I think that's something we need to all think about. It's not about changing just our aspirations, but the first thing that had to change was they had to change the heart. And he gave them this command, and you'll know it. You don't even need to turn there. It's repeated in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus quoted it. But in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, this is the command God gave to Moses for the people of Israel that had come out of slavery. And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Then in the second part of this command, he says, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. There's a repetition of the word heart. We shall love the Lord with all of our hearts, and then his commands are to be written on our hearts. Now, when the Bible refers to the heart of a person or the soul of a person, it's not some compartment, you know. I've got this part of me and that part of me and this and there. There's this sort of uh, part of me that's the heart part of me. Actually, no, it's got to do with my deep inner core values. It is there that God says we need to first change. If we want to change the direction of our life, if we want to change how we behave, if we want to change the place to start, God says, first things first. We need to change the heart. And he used the terminology there, which we're so used to, but we actually need to embrace the depth of it. It's a terminology that he says there, to love the Lord with all your heart. It is a kind of change that needs to happen in the heart where my heart becomes consumed with this one thing, that I love the Lord from my core values, from the first principles of my life, is where love and obedience are to flow from if my life is going to change direction. Now, interestingly, that this command was given to them, and yet 40 years on, there were only two men that had come out of slavery whose heart adjusted according to this command. Only two out of our whole nation had their hearts changed. 
The two you'll know well, their names Joshua and Caleb. And interesting that God refers to them and he says the reason why they are going to enter this changed life into the promised land was because their hearts changed. And he describes them as those that followed God wholeheartedly, which means this loving the Lord with all of their heart had changed in their lives and they had got to a place where their heart its core values had been changed. It wasn't just a, a resolution that they had taken in their minds or in their actions to obey God, but their hearts changed. And God says because of that, they can enter into the promises of God. There was a heart adjustment. And what this shows us is that as human beings, we have a tendency to want to change things in certain ways with certain decisions and so on. But if we want our lives to change long term, we need to allow God to change our hearts. We need God to change the deep convictions of our hearts if we're going to change our ways. Now, the thing is, sometimes we confuse what does it mean to have these heart values. And I, I generally know that we can confuse the difference between what's important to us and what a heart value is. They're not the same. You can take an average Christian and you can say to them, well, what is your heart values? And they'll probably give you a list of things that are very important to them. But when you actually dig deep and you say to them, but out of that list of what you say is important to you, what things on that list would you die for? No matter what pressure came your way, what are those things that no matter what comes, no matter what happens in your life, those things you will not let go what are those things that almost subconsciously are steering your life that you don't even think about, but they are the ones that make your decisions ultimately? And then you're reaching what we can call the deep heart values that God was speaking about, to love the Lord with the deepest convictions that when everything else fades away, I'll hold on to that one thing that I love the Lord with all my heart. And we can take many examples. You can ask most Christians and you say, well, list your values, and probably on their list would be prayer. Your prayers are value to me. And it would be true, but yet when you ask them, but okay, if prayer is a value to you, how does it impact your daily decisions and your daily life? Are you praying regularly? If you say prayer is important, are you praying regularly? Are you showing up at the prayer meetings? Are you praying for South Africa regularly, not just every now and then? Is it such a thing that when everything else fails, you're holding on to prayer? I will not give up. Even when there's so much pressure for my time, I will not. I will die for this privilege that I have to pray. And so I, I use it as an example to say there's a difference between our aspirations and our important values than the deep things of our hearts. And it is in that deep place where God wants us to change, to align our hearts with his value. Now, there was a character in the New Testament. He's, the, he's generally known as the rich young ruler. And he had that aspiration, a high value to obey God. And he, he came to Jesus and he, he was asking about, you know, what must I do with my life? What must I change? I already obey the best that I know, but what else can I do to change my level of obedience? I really want to push into God. And so he had a high aspiration of obedience, like many of us do. But Jesus dug past the aspirations, the important things of his life, the things that were valuable to him. And he dug deep into the heart values and he said to him, all right, this is what you need to do. Go and sell everything you have. Give it away, give to the poor, then come and follow me. And when he said that to this rich young ruler, what happened was there was now a wrestle between his core values and what was important to him. And, and we know who wins that fight. When the pressure's on, what's going to win the fight of which choice I'm going to make in my life, our core values will always trump. They will come out tops. We can have something very important, but when the pressure's on, it's what's deep inside my heart that's going to make me choose my direction. And so there was something deep in his life that he was held as a core value, and it says he was very wealthy and he wanted to hold on to that. And so when, when the pressure was on, he said he turned away from Jesus and he went away sad. His, his path was set by his core values. On the other hand, we have somebody like Job. We know his story in the, in the Old Testament. He lost everything. I mean, he had every reason to be upset with God. 
And so he, he lost his health, he lost his kids, he, he, he was really in a place of deep suffering. And his wife comes to him and says, why don't you just curse God? Just curse God and die. And at that point, the pressure was on of thinking, well, God really doesn't care for me. He really doesn't care that I'm suffering. So, so why don't I just give up on God, just curse God and die? But we find there that Job's response was, I can't do that. I have every reason, the pressure's on, but deep in his heart there was this core value that says, but I honor God above all things. And so he said, I can't do that. And in fact, he says, even if God slays me, I will still bless him. You see, in the end, his decision was made when all the pressure was on by his core values. And so we need to realize we want to change the direction of our lives. The first things that must change is we've got to change the deep core values of your heart. And to develop this in my second point is that the primary reason that Israel's heart didn't change and why they ended up wandering in the desert was because their hearts had become hard. And so we're building on this thing that the heart values must change, but if our hearts become hard, we're going to end up wandering and wandering and not progressing. And so this lesson from Israel's wandering is developed for us in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. And I'm just going to take a few verses from Hebrews 3, and I'd love you to turn there, where the writer to the Hebrews is actually explaining what went on in the hearts of the Israelites in the desert and why they didn't progress and, and achieve the aspirations. They all had the aspirations of living as these free people under God in their promised land. Why didn't they get there? The, the writer to the Hebrews explains it as follows. And I'd like to read from verse 7 all the way to verse 13. And yeah, he says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, and he quotes from Psalm 95, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But... Exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And what you will see in that passage is this repetition of this word hardening, the hardening of heart. And it is something that I believe we need to take great care about in our hearts. The Bible says, take care of your heart because it is this wellspring of life. And what must we do to take care of our hearts? I believe we've got to take care that our hearts do not become hard towards God. And when we understand that, I believe at the beginning of this year, we can put that as the first thing I need to make sure in my heart that I have a soft heart towards God. And it's a question I want to put to you today. Is is your heart soft towards God? We're going to talk a little bit more about what that looks like, but I want to ask you the question right now. Is your heart soft towards God? I want to ask you to think about it, not just to give the religious response, but to ask deeply in your heart today, is my heart soft towards God? Is there a hardening? The old song that, uh, from the 70s, Oh, Lord, my heart's become hard. Would you soften it up, Lord? And so I want to put that to you today. Now, I want to examine this process of the hardening of the hearts of the Israelites so that we can learn some things from them, that we can learn their lessons and not follow the same journey of hardening of heart. But the first thing that we see, he says there, harden not your hearts. In other words, the hardening of the heart is a choice that we make. He says, 
Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. In other words, you have the choice to harden your heart or not. We must not think that ultimately it's just life that made me hard. That yes, life will come and put the pressure on you like Job to harden your heart. But at every step of hardness of heart, we take a choice. And we harden our hearts and we harden our hearts and we harden our hearts. And ultimately, we can get to a place like the Israelites where their hearts were so hard that they couldn't progress. And so we need to realize it's a choice. The second thing we need to see from the Israelites is that the problem with the hardening heart, it says there, and they did not know my ways. That terminology, they did not know my ways, it means they did not know me intimately. God's ways are his deep inner uh, compassions, his deep inner faithfulness, that when we know his ways, it's like we're knowing who he is and we know his heart. And it says when we harden our hearts, we end up causing a gap between us and the heart of God that we are struggling to know the heart of God in our situation. And we can be in South Africa and we can develop a hard heart and it will overflow in all kinds of things. And our hearts can be coming, becoming hard because of the situation, the circumstances, the things we don't like around us. And we can slowly but surely harden our hearts. And the problem is, is we can slowly but surely lose God's heart for our own nation. And our hearts can become hard towards the problems and what's going on and the people and the whatever. But we need to realize symptom of a hardening of heart is slowly but surely we also lose a grasp of the heart of God. The third thing that we see here is that God says, and their heart's always wandering from me, is that the third thing that we see, a hardness of heart, will ultimately mean we start to wander from God. And it's something that we need to embrace in our lives, is that we can have all the resolutions in the world. If our hearts are hard towards God, we're going to end up down the road wandering from Him. And that's a reality we need to face. It's not just that you've got a good list and a good plan and everything is going to work out fine. If your heart's hard towards God, down the line, you're going to end up wandering from God. Wandering from his ways. I want to quote a, a verse that Jesus used also about the same situation in Israel. And it does touch on the subject of divorce. And I don't want you to be distracted by that, that problem. Because that's not my message that I want you to listen around the topic. He could have used any other issues. But Jesus said in Matthew 19 verse 8, you don't need to turn there. But he said to them, because of your hardness of heart... Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. And what Jesus was teaching us here is that there are certain things in life that we were not designed to go through. We were not designed to experience certain things. We were not made like that by God. But it is almost as though Moses allowed this thing to go through. We were not designed to go through things like divorce and separation, and breaking of trust. We're not designed as human beings to go through stuff like that. But it's almost like Moses allowed it because there was a hardness of heart in the people of Israel at the time. So he, he, he established a legal process of divorce. He established it. But the lesson I want to draw from that is that it's very interesting to me that God didn't just come and say, okay, your hearts are hard, and so there's all these problems, so I'm going to break into your heart. I'm going to smash through the doors of your hard heart, and I'm going to go inside your heart, and I'm going to sort things out in your heart so that we can stop this problem. He didn't do that. He actually allowed Moses to make these laws of divorce, even though it was not the way he designed us, rather than to transgress the threshold to cross the threshold, rather, of our hearts, which points to us something very important about God and our hearts, is that when God said, I want you to love me with all of your heart, at that point, he also made a choice that he will not bash through a hard heart to make you love him. Because the moment we're forced to love somebody, it's no longer true love. And God wants us to love us from the heart. So if we harden our hearts, he will not break through that door. And it is something that for me is so tragic. And I, I know that I've done these things in my own life, that there's been times where I've hardened my heart, and I realize that God doesn't break through those doors. He will not force his way in. He will continue to knock, but he will not break that door down. Something we need to realize is a hardness of heart means there's something of a separation between us and God that comes into our hearts that He will not push His way through. He will wait for you to soften your heart. My third point, 
First things first, we need to make sure we soften our hearts towards God. And I want to look at that this morning. This thing of softening our hearts towards Him. When you consider your heart, I ask you to think about your own heart today. The passage in Hebrews gives us some things that will help us to do things that will keep our hearts soft. I want to go through some of the things. These are things that will help us to keep our hearts soft. Things that we can do right now to soften our hearts towards God. The first thing that we read in Hebrews chapter 3, right at the beginning of the chapter, the writer uses these words. He says, look to Jesus or consider Jesus. Those two words, consider Jesus, I believe that our hearts cannot remain hard when we're considering Jesus. And one of the reasons I think our hearts can slowly become hard is that we stop thinking about Jesus. It says consider Him. Now that word consider is not just a vague thought. It means pay attention. Jesus said, look at the lilies of the field. He said to His disciples, stop, look at the lilies of the field. It's the same word that is used there. Stop, look at Jesus. Look at His faithfulness. Look at the cross. Look at the fact that he's seated on the throne interceding for you right now. Look to that. It will soften your heart today. I want to ask you right now, consider Christ. Think of what Lucas shared this morning. Consider the fact that he weeps over your heart. He weeps over the things that are wrong in your life. He weeps over you. Consider Jesus. It will soften your heart. The second thing about that from Hebrews is he says that today... If you hear my voice, do not harden your heart. The second thing, to keep a soft heart, is we need to make sure we're responding to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. Are we responding to what God is saying to us by His Spirit? And I want to talk about that because this to me is one of the most critical things of a soft heart, is how we relate to the speaking voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives. To me, it's the most practical and the most critical thing to keep our hearts soft is this. Now, I want to go to the passage I've alluded to it already in Revelation chapter 3, where Jesus sends a message to a church. This was not a message to unbelievers, people that aren't Christians. This was a message to Christians. And he wrote to them in Revelation 3 verse 20. Remember, this is to believers. Because often this verse is used to describe how to get saved. How to become a Christian. But he says to the Christians, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whose door is he at knocking? Your heart and mine. Not the unbelievers. He's got a process with them as well, but I'm not talking about that. But he's standing at the door and he's knocking at your heart. Then he says, If anyone hears my voice, he's speaking. God is speaking to you today. I can prove that to you from Many, many scriptures, God is speaking to you today. He's knocking and he's speaking. But then comes this next part. So that's a guarantee for all of us today. There's a knocking and there's a speaking. Then he says, if, there's the condition, if anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Now that's a picture of a fellowship meal. It is a picture of an experience of the presence of God in the innermost parts of my being. If you want to keep your heart soft, there's a condition here. How am I responding to what God is saying, to the knocking? Now, if you remember the process here, there was a knock first, then there was a speaking. And we, 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 as he says, I'm knocking if you hear my voice, not hear my knocking, if you hear my voice. And then open the door, there's fellowship. There's the three things Jesus is doing. He's knocking, he's speaking, and he wants to come in and fellowship with you. He wants you to experience his presence. Fellowship with Christ will change the core values of my being. This fellowship with Christ, that's what I need. And it starts with the knocking. Now, what is knocking in our lives? Knocking, I think, is very obvious. But to get our attention, there are things that will come across our past that are getting our attention If your mind is racing like mine, you should be thinking now, but is there not maybe something's happening in my life right now that God is trying to get my attention? 
here at the beginning of the year, with everything going on, is there not something, there's a knocking. Something happening in my life. God is wanting to get your attention. Why does he want your attention? Because he's speaking. And we've got so many voices going on, but he wants to get our attention, and he wants us to hear. What is God saying to you? And I believe you don't have to wait till tonight. You don't have to wait till you have some hour-long prayer time somewhere. Right now, what is God saying? God is speaking to you about your heart. He's speaking to you about things in your heart that must change. Things in your heart that he wants to soften. Things in your heart that he wants to replace his values uh, with the wrong values that you may have in certain areas of your heart. He wants to speak to you about that. Like the rich young ruler. He had made his own plans about what he was going to do with his life. But Jesus spoke and said, there's stuff in your heart. You've got to let that thing out. I want to come in there, but there's something blocking there. I need to take that out. And he said, no, close the door. You're not coming in here. What's God saying to you? And I think this is an emphasis I'd like to make this morning. Sometimes we say to Jesus, I will do all these things for you. I will do all these things. I'll do all the right stuff for you. As long as you don't touch that thing in my heart. And I believe that's the very thing that very often the Holy Spirit is speaking to us about. So you can give me all your obedience. You can give me all the stuff and all your sacrifices and service and ministry, whatever. But if your heart is not given over, that area of your heart, you'll wander from my ways. So this morning, I want to ask you, today if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. The problem is, We've seen it over years and years, is that the more we lose the expectation for God to speak to me, the more we become almost surprised when he does say something, and the more we actually are able to harden our hearts to his speaking voice. I want to ask you, do you expect God to speak? God wants to speak to you. He's a speaking God. His name is the Word. He speaks. He wants to speak to you into your heart today. So that's the second one, how to soften our hearts. The third one is very interesting. And it applies to all of you here. It says, but encourage one another daily. Exhort one another daily. God has got a special oil that he pours on the heart to make it soft. And that's the gathering together of his people in church. There is something about this gathering And he wrote to the Hebrews, he says, don't neglect it. But when we're together with others, it softens our hearts. And we actually need it not just once a week. We need it daily. We need to be together. We need to be in person with other believers because it brings the softening of our hearts. Then there were some warnings about what will harden our hearts. And I quickly want to go through those. But we read in this passage, or might remember as we read it through in Hebrews 3, he spoke there about You have a wicked, unbelieving heart. I want to say, unbelief causes hardness of heart. It's written there, a wicked, unbelieving heart. Now, we've got to just clarify some things. Doubt and unbelief are not the same thing. We often find how Jesus would encourage those that were weak in the faith. He said, oh, you of little faith. We do not find a scripture that condemns the person that wants to believe but is struggling. Even the, 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 the one that said to Jesus, help me in my unbelief. You see, God is not out there thinking, well, if you just doubt by the slightest little thing, you know, that you've got a hard heart. No, not at all. He talks about a wicked, unbelieving heart. And what does that mean? It's a state of unbelief that actually where I've got to a place where my heart has become so unbelieving that I've become hardened towards God. There's no longer something in me that's expectant. There's no longer something in me that trusts God. But there are areas of my life where it's just like this hard unbelief that's crusted over my heart. It's not the person that doubts and is trying and wants to press in. You'll never be condemned for that. We all struggle at times with doubt. But this is termed a wicked, unbelieving heart. And that's a sign of hardening of heart. We need to be very careful of unbelief. One of the areas in particular that we need to be careful of is when it comes to the supernatural working of God. And one of the things I want to mention is that perhaps we've been disappointed by 
prayers, we prayed for God to come in power and he didn't answer. Maybe somebody you prayed for for healing and they didn't get healed or you prayed for some breakthrough and it never came the way you thought and you had to go through sufferings, whatever. What can happen, and it is something that we need to guard our hearts against, is we can become unbelieving in a part of our hearts against the supernatural power of God to intervene into our world, into our lives. And we need to soften our hearts and say, God, even though I don't understand why I prayed for this person, they didn't get healed. I prayed for myself, I didn't get healed. But Lord, I will soften my heart to say, you are all the things that you are in the scriptures, I believe that. I will hold on to that. You are a God of power. Maybe we're not seeing it. Maybe there's some people that are abusing it and all these kind of things. But I will soften my heart to trust you as a God of the supernatural. Another thing that is mentioned here that hardened the hearts of the Israelites is, what they, is that they tested God. And I want to be very brief. Testing God is simply this. It's to say, you know what? God loves me more than my sin. And so I can sin and whatever, and God will always just be there to pick me up. You know what? That's a term in the Scriptures called testing God. You are testing His grace, testing His mercy and His kindness by saying, I don't care. God loves me more than my sins. So I can carry on sinning. He'll bring me back. I'll stop eventually. We need to understand it's a sign of a hardening of heart. The third thing that he mentions there is rebellion. Now, that word rebellion, immediately one would think perhaps a rebellious teenager or whatever. The rebellion spoken of here is when we actually, we, in our lives, slowly but surely get to the place where I take charge of the course and the direction of my own life. God says it's rebellion. You were bought with a price. You are not your own. And we find that rebellion is not something we want to easily put on anybody but a person that says, I'm going to live my life, I'll make my choices. God, you just come and bless me every now and then. I need your help, but I'm choosing the course of my life. The scripture says it's rebellion. It's a sign of a hardness of heart. A soft heart says, Lord, everything I have comes from you. Every choice I need to make, I need to make knowing that you have a plan for my life. My last point, just very briefly just some things of my own thoughts. What does a person look like with a soft heart towards God? And then I'd like to pray for us. I was asking Dalian about what does it look like to you immediately. We, came up with, we could have come up with many other examples. It's a very dear person who used to be in our church that I just want to share his testimony. He, he came onto leadership in this church many years ago. And he was still quite a youngish, youngish believer. And... Uh, so when people come on to leadership, one of the things we do, we sit down with them and we say, you know, are there any skeletons in your cupboard? Things that you've done in your past that are not being sorted out, they're not in the light, that maybe you're on leadership and then uh, somebody arrives at our church and says, hey, that person's did this and this and this. And then the whole church is now in trouble because you, we've got one of our leaders and there's this stuff. So I just asked him this question, you know, we ask it of our leaders. And his eyes got big and he looked at me and he says, yeah, there are some things. And uh, I said, like what? He says, well, I committed crime. I said, oh, really? And he said, it was covered up. It was, never, it was never discovered. And there were insurance claims involved and all these kind of things. So I looked at him and I said, you know what? You're going to have to go back to the insurance company and tell them what you did. And you're going to have to go to the police and tell them that that's what happened. Now, there's a test for you. So he immediately said to me, okay, I'll do it. He went, said goodbye to his family, said, I might not be coming home. He went to the police and he says, it was a long time ago, he says, this is what I did, this is what happened. The police looked at their records and they said, sorry, that case, is, we don't even have the file for it anymore. He went to the insurance company and they said, no, those things were bought out by some other company, they don't exist anymore, we've got no records. Came back to me, he said, okay, I've done it. I said, is there anything else? He says, yeah. I said, what? He says, he said, no, I never did the driver's test. I bought my license. So I said, would you better go and tell them? So he went to the traffic department and he says, I got my license. I never, I never did the test. They didn't know what to do with him. They had a discussion. They said, we don't know what to do with you. Eventually, they made him do the test again, and he got his license again. But when I think of him, dear man, it's a softness of heart. I mean, literally, he could have ended up in jail. He could have been sitting in prison. But he had a softness of heart before God. 
So what does a person look like with a soft heart? I believe a soft heart towards God is a heart where God can work to change us. It's not the perfect person. It's not the most well-behaved person necessarily. Sometimes you've got all the rough edges, even like David. He did all kinds of stuff wrong, but he had a soft heart that God could say to him, you're a man after my own heart. It's a soft heart. God can work in you. It's not this religious rock heart heart on the inside with all the good behavior on the outside, but your heart's a hard heart. A person with a soft heart Somebody that longs and prays and cries out for the wrong things in my heart to be changed. Say, Lord, I don't want to have these things. Would you change me? I long to be more like you, Jesus. Change my heart. That's a soft heart. A soft hearted person is not a pushover like a weak person. You think of Joshua and Caleb. They were great, powerful people in the kingdom of God. Great leaders, great military leaders even for Israel. And yet they were soft in their hearts towards God. A soft-hearted person is one that says, Lord, you're the first one that I serve. And when I blow it, I come back to the sink. You are the first one that I serve. Before my family, before anything else in my life, you are the first one that I serve. It's a soft-hearted person. A soft-hearted person towards God is one that sees his relationship with Jesus as more important than any other thing. He will contend for that. He'll die for that, for his relationship with Jesus above all else. A soft-hearted person is one that sees God as his ultimate source for success, for life, for everything else. God, you're my source. It means he's got a soft heart. A soft-hearted person, I put here, is a person that loves. Maybe they don't always get it right. Certainly, we don't all get it right. But it's a person that loves. Loves God first. A person that loves people. And they might get angry. They might have some offenses, but they come back to the thing. We love people. We love God. A soft-hearted person, somebody that when he goes through those things in his life that he can't explain, he can't say, God, I don't know. You don't make sense to me. It doesn't seem to be right what you're doing. But a soft-hearted person says, Lord, I trust your character. Even though I can't explain my circumstances, I trust who you are. It's a soft-hearted person. So here as we start this year, I want to put this to you and I want us to pray. The most important thing to start off this year is to soften your heart before God wherever it's needed. You might have some areas soft, some areas hard, like the soil in the parable of the sower. But soften your heart before God. The starting place for me is what is the Spirit saying to you? Because the Holy Spirit is going to be saying specific things to you about your heart this morning. What are the things in your heart If the Spirit is speaking, do not harden your heart as the Israelites did. Hear His voice today. What is He saying to you? What are the things in in your heart that He's saying that thing? Like the rich young ruler, that thing. Give it to me. So I'd like us to close in just two minutes of prayer. I've asked them to play a well-known song in the background about, Lord, you can have my heart. And I'm going to pray for us. To stay where you are. There's no need in me pretending. Lord, we want to come before you. Like the words of the song, we want to say, Lord, you can have my heart. I want to give my heart to you, Lord. Not for salvation, but I want to give my heart to you. That you can come in and work, change, put your principles in my heart. Lord, where I have fixed my eyes on other things, today I consider Jesus. Beautiful Jesus. Lord, where I have hardened my heart, blocked my ears to your voice, I say, Lord, you can have my heart. Speak, Lord, I'm listening. Lord, where maybe I've grown rebellious, I've taken control of my own life, Oh, Lord, I soften my heart and say, Lord, you can have my heart. Lord, may I have tested you, perhaps been casual and just thinking you'll just carry on forgiving and forgiving. Oh, Lord, I soften my heart and I say, Lord, you can have my heart. Closing, even us as your church today, 
We say you can have our heart, Lord. We give you everything, Lord. In Jesus' name. I'd like you just to take two, three minutes. Just stay where you are. And say to the Lord, you can have my heart. you Lord we soften our hearts before you because we love you so much above all else in Jesus name our hearts are yours Lord amen